All right. Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about X Registry and cloud events in general. And mostly, I want to focus on how do we get to X Registry, kind of um, starting with cloud events, moving through the cloud events at SQL, which is another project the cloud events community came to, and then getting into X Registry and trying to understand why are we doing all this and what are the key concepts of all these different projects. So to start, I'm Callum Murray. I'm currently in engineering science at the University of Toronto. I do research into language models for software engineering tasks, as well as event-driven and serverless systems. I'm also a Knative eventing maintainer and UX lead and a cloud events contributor, where I focus mostly on cloud events SQL. And I'll be joining Red Hat as a software engineer next summer. So to start, let's start with cloud events. So why do we have cloud events? Um, I like to think of an analogy as you know, connecting different devices. If they have the same type of port or connection, it's really easy, you just plug it in. But if they have different port types and it doesn't match, you actually need to get another piece. You need an adapter of some kind to connect these. And that's really the problem that Cloud Events is trying to approach. Because when we're developing an app, there's a lot of different pieces that we need to put together that often speak different languages. And a lot of our job is just connecting these different services. They might be like third-party SaaS offerings, or even just other teams within the same company. And we want to make sure that they're all able to talk to each other as easily as possible. So as an example, I might have two cloud services. And the first one wants to send you know, just hello world into the second one. And that's all easy if they're in the same protocol. But what if the first one speaks MQTT and the second one wants to receive Kafka? Now I've got a bit of a problem. And so oftentimes you'll see people um, basically building these boxes like on the left with the producer, so you have your business logic in green, and then you've got some kind of glue that turns that data you have into MQTT or maybe converting your MQTT T data into a delivery protocol of some kind, for, in this case Kafka. And then on the consumer side, you still have more custom glue translating Kafka into something you can speak, and then you have all your business logic in green which actually handles data. So there's a lot of like glue here that we're writing over and over again that we don't necessarily need and that isn't providing any business value. And we need to do this for every different protocol we're interacting with. And this gets worse when we have a lot of services, especially if we want to have some kind of routing middleware in the middle. If I wanted to be able to do different things like filtering the data to different destinations and I'm getting different protocols and I have to speak different protocols on the way out, this is really expensive to implement and really hard. And so this is where cloud events come in. It's basically a specification for describing the metadata in a common way. And then they have different ways to bind this metadata onto all these different protocols. And so all you need to do is pick which protocol you're sending into, and Cloud Events has code that's able to map your data into that protocol. And so whereas before we have this custom glue in yellow, with Cloud Events, we just call the Cloud Events library on every side. And our code only ever has to interact with cloud events, and our business logic produces cloud events and consumes cloud events. And then we just add a little bit from a cloud events library to send, hey, send this into Kafka, or consume this out of NATS. So yeah, in Go, you know, we have a handle function that just takes in a cloud event. Or in Java, we might have an event consumer that has a handle event method, which again, takes in a cloud event. And so I don't need to worry about the different protocols in my code anymore. And then, as I was saying, when I want to send or receive the event, this is just some Go code, and you can see there's, um, you make an HTTP client, and then you give it a target, saying like localhost 8080, and then I just send the event. And so that's not very much work to send an HTTP. Or if I want to receive a NATS, I'd make a new NATS consumer. Um, there's a bit of like error handling and stuff. And then I just start a receiver, which has a function which takes in the cloud events that are taken out of NATS. And so I don't need to really do that much work around these protocols anymore. And I just can speak the same language everywhere and in different programming languages. So with cloud events, that routing, again, it's all cloud events in the middle. So it's easy. I don't need to worry about translating all these protocols anymore. I just have to speak cloud events. So the way that cloud events does this is that events have a set of what we call context attributes, which describe the metadata. Um, they're basically like typed headers for HTTP. Um, and there's four that are required. You need to say which specification of cloud events you're using. That makes sense. 
Um, it's how the libraries are able to handle the thing. They need to give an ID to the event, a source, and a type. Um, and then the cool thing is you can add any number of optional like user-defined attributes, and so you can extend this to have whatever information you care about. And so commonly you might copy a couple things out of your payload into the context attributes, which you might want to use for routing. And beyond just defining these attributes, as I was mentioning before, it defines how these should be serialized and deserialized into different protocols. And this is really where that um, reduction in complexity in your code comes from. So this is all handled by cloud events in a consistent way. And there's two ways that these encodings can happen for each protocol. There's a binary encoding, where all of the attributes go into the headers and the data is the payload. Or there's a structured encoding where you just have a big JSON payload and all of the attributes are JSON keys and values and then all of your data is in a data key. So for example, in HTTP, an event could serialize on the left in, in binary and we can see we've got CE-spec version or CE-type and all these different cloud events attributes as headers. And then in the body of that HTTP request is all the data. And then if I change that into structured, the spec version and the type and all the other attributes go inside the JSON of the request, like in the request body. And there's a data key now which has the application data, data embedded within it. So there's, there's trade-offs to both approaches, but generally speaking, binary is probably what you want to go with. It's also backwards compatible. If you have a payload and you want to add cloud events to it, you just have to add a couple headers. You don't need to change anything else about your request. Same with Kafka. In Kafka, on the left, we have the binary version. We see we've got some headers. Um, and then the data is just in the value for that um, Kafka record. And then on the right, we have the structured Kafka where it's all in the record. And here again, if you want to adopt cloud events into an existing Kafka system, you just have to add some headers to your records. You don't have to change anything about the rest of how you structure your data. Um, there are use cases for structured. For example, if you wanted to talk with AWS, they normally require structured cloud events um, as a rule. Um, the nice thing for you is the choosing between binary and structured is just a uh, setting in the library. You don't have to really worry too much about it. But in general, try and default to binary where you can. So one of the things that comes out of this consistent metadata across all of our events is we can probably query information out of them now that they all have the same consistent metadata and there's a, we know where it is and what it is. And so one of the things we were wondering in the cloud events community is what's the best way to query information of these events if they all have this consistent metadata? And what we came up with is cloud events SQL. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the why and how it works. So um, the why is pretty simple. It's just you have, um, you have a whole bunch of data going in a system and you have, you're consistently describing it and so you want to be able to ask questions about it and you want to be able to um, extract some data from it and we want to be able to do it in a language independent way. So you don't have, we don't want you have to write it once for Go and once for Java depending on how you're processing it. And so we wanted to make a specification and a runtime where you can lean on what you're used to when you write SQL to extract this information. And so in June 2024, Cloud Events released Cloud Events SQL version one. Um, and it's just a, a simple language, it's not even Turing complete, that allows for computing events, values, and matching attributes from the, con like the Cloud Event context attributes. And you can build pretty complex expressions. And it really leans on the syntax of SQL where clauses. That's where the Cloud Events SQL comes from. Um, and one of the interesting things about the language as a design decision was made is that each expression gives you a tuple of the result and any errors that were encountered along the way of the computation. And so even if you get errors, you still get a result out. And maybe if you look at those errors, you still are okay with the result or maybe not. And so that's a decision you get to make yourself. Um, and you can also optionally decide, hey, fail as soon as you get the first error and don't keep going. And then it fails a bit faster for you in some use cases. So if I wanted to access an event attribute, for example, an ID, in Cloud Events SQL, I only have to write ID and I get that attribute out of the Cloud Event. So this, this is really simple. And I can start going much more complicated. For example, if I want to check if an attribute exists in the Cloud Event, there's this keyword exists, which you can use, which just checks if that's there. Um, if you just want to write this, another little trick is 
Um, if you're just checking if it exists, because you always get a result out, you could just write subject and see if you get an error. And if you got an error, that means it's not there. But maybe in a complex expression, you wanna check if it exists, or you wanna have simpler error handling, and so you wanna use the exist keyword. Or you can do comparisons. So I can check if first name is equal to Jane, or any other string or any comparison I might care about here. And then going beyond that, I can start chaining them with Boolean operations of and and or. And this is where we start to get into being able to write really complex questions about our events that are streaming through our system. And going beyond that, we can start nesting them. And so this lets us set kind of the precedence and what's more important in these expressions. And if you want to do fancier matching, we also support the like expression you've seen in SQL, where you can have wildcard characters. And so with all of these different types of matching, you're able to really represent, hope, at least we hope, complex questions about the events that are going through your system. Beyond that, there's built-in function calls. I picked a couple. There's about 20 or 30 built-in functions. So you can check the length of a string. You can concatenate multiple strings. You can take the left portion of a string. You can take a substring. And one of the cool things is there's type conversion between all the types. So if you have a cloud of an attribute that isn't a string, you can just concatenate it anyways and it'll get converted to a string. Um, just make sure you check how that conversion works for your different types because you want to understand what you're doing in the expression. Beyond that, if you don't like the built-in functions, the SQL engine actually supports you defining your own built-in functions that you can then use in your expressions, just as you would any other function. And you, these are typed, so you can say, hey, this value needs to be a string, or this value needs to be an integer, and Cloud Events SQL will handle all the type conversions for you, and then your code just works with whatever types you said it should accept. And so one of the best use cases for this is actually for event filtering. So in the Knative project, they've adopted Cloud Events SQL inside the Knative brokers for filtering of the data. And so you're able to now define on these triggers, which basically a trigger connects the broker to some destination that cares about events. And when you write the trigger, if you look here in the filters in the middle, there's CESQL. And so you can write any complex SQL expression you care about to determine what data should go to your event consumer. This is kind of the main use case we see for this Cloud Events SQL so far, and it lets you write filters for what data should go through. You could also use it for extracting data from events or combining data from a Cloud Event and putting it into another attribute, but the best use case we can think of it so far and where we've seen people using it has been for filtering. If you have other use cases for Cloud Events SQL, please talk to us, open an issue on GitHub or join the CNCF Slack because um, we'd love to hear about other use cases and see if there's anything we can add to support them. But so far, it's been mostly designed with filtering in mind. But there's a couple questions that comes when I'm writing these filters to try and get the data to the right place. For example, how do I know which attributes are actually existing on events in my system? I don't want to have to always use the exists keyword to check if it's there. Even if I know that an attribute's there, how do I know what kind of values it can have? If I don't know what values they'll take, how do I write any kind of comparison to see if my expression makes sense? And you know, if I'm supposed to like implement these filters, how do I know, even know which endpoints in my system wants which events? And so all these questions are actually pretty hard in a large decoupled event-driven system. If I've got hundreds of event sources and dozens to hundreds of events consumers, understanding what's flowing in my system gets really complicated really fast. And yeah, another one, where, do, where are the events even coming from, <laughs> right? If I've got hundreds of them, which, one, which events come from where? So this is where X registry comes in. Um, we'll talk more about it in a second, um, but basically today I wanna to talk about for X registry, what problem is it actually solving? Um, a little bit about how it solves the problem and some basic details, but nothing too complicated since the spec's evolving a lot. So, a lot of the problems of X registry is solving is how you ask those questions I was asking before. So what events are used in a specific context? There's a registry where you have them all defined. Um, it's called the message registry. What do the payloads look like for these events? There's a schema registry which contains all of the different schemas of my payloads. 
Um, if I care where the events are being produced or consumed, there's an endpoints registry which has all the endpoints in my system and well as metadata is like, this is a consumer, this is a producer. Um, and an interesting question which X registry is asking is, what if I need to manage other types of metadata too? Like they don't want to make an assumption on the only metadata you need to deal with is just about these events and these schemas and stuff. You probably have other metadata in your system. And so how do you manage this all consistently across all these different metadata formats and all of this metadata that your large system is creating? So X registry is an, a specification, similar to all the other cloud events projects, for managing this metadata in a common and extensible way. The X in X registry stands for extensible registry. And so you're able to extend it with whatever other metadata you care about tracking. So the idea is there's this core specification on how the registry should work, and then they've provided some specific registries. Um, so they have the event definition registry, which has been called, it's called the message registry these days, I think. There's a schema registry and an endpoints registry, which are all like built-in registry specifications they give for here's a specific registry, but they'll all have the same API. And so if you have your own metadata you care about tracking, you can define it, and then it will have the same API as all the other registries that are running in your system. So yeah, you can make your own custom registries. And the cool thing is, um, they'll all have this API. And so your tooling can consistently talk to your metadata across all the different types of metadata you have. Um, so the, We'll get more into exactly how these URLs work, but the high level idea is that you have different groups of metadata. Um, for example, schemas or messages or endpoints. And then you have within those kind of types of groups, subgroups, which hold, like a group ID will hold you know, a collection of some messages and some, me some metadata about that collection of messages. And then you've got that collection of resources and then you can keep going down. And so it's a, a nested structure of metadata. So to make this a bit more concrete, since I know when I saw this, it was a bit too abstract to understand, um, I wanna look specifically at the message registry, which would contain information about events. So if I get slash message groups, slash message groups is that gr all caps group from the main API definition. So if I were to get slash message groups, it would give me all of the different groupings of messages that I have in my registry right now. And for each of those groups, it's gonna give me some metadata about the groups, and then all of the nested messages and metadata about those, and it keeps going down the structure. I can also get a specific group. So in that group, it, as I said before, it'll have the metadata about the group, um, and then it will have some nested data. So maybe one of these groups is for some kind of logical grouping of APIs in your system, and you have some metadata you care about for that group. Maybe there's a team that manages that group of messages, and so you care about w what team manages that or something like that. And also there's normal metadata like um, the version and stuff like that that would be stored in the group. Then you can start get getting specific messages from the group, and this will have metadata about the message, um, for example, if it's a cloud event, this will tell you what attributes are there, maybe what values are in that cloud event as well. And that's all versioned, so if we go back a couple slides to here, you can see that there's versions for all these resources. So if I want to update one of my messages, I can just add a new version, and you can see all the versions that are currently there. Um, similar, if I wanted to do schemas, it's the exact same like access pattern, but now I'm getting schemas instead of messages. So if I care about the payload now instead of those context attributes in the cloud event, I can use the schema registry. And maybe decoupling these actually gives us some useful things. Maybe I have the same payload on different events, and so I can have that all referenced through this message and schema decoupling. Similar to how I've been using get to retrieve everything, you can also use all the normal post and put and patch and delete methods to create and update different groups and resources. Um, it works exactly how you'd expect an HTTP server to work in that respect. So the key thing is that x lets us extend and reference other metadata. For example, 
I can define a base message, which you see on the right side of this diagram, which is a generic cloud events message, and put all the metadata about how that um, message works, so what attributes on the cloud event. And then I can make specific messages which reference the original message. And these can be for different bindings. For example, for HTTP, I might care about which HTTP method do I actually want to use for this cloud event. And so I can specify, hey, this needs to be a post. And any other information I need to say, maybe there's an extra HTTP header my system needs. So I can do that and still point back to the original cloud event. And so I, this lets me model more complex things. And a lot of the ideas you'll see in, for example, like object-oriented design, you can start using with these different references. Um, it also lets me choose how to organize and group the metadata. My favorite example of this is the endpoints registry, which we see in the X registry. So the endpoints registry is basically giving me information about different endpoints in my system. And if you think about the key things I care about in an endpoint, um, it might be things about who can access it, how to access it, but also, which messages can I receive, right? And that's already being covered in the messages registry. So how can I model that? Well, the endpoint registry, instead of having a nested resource type of endpoint, is basically a registry that also contains messages. So in the groups, you get these endpoint groups, like slash scan or slash test, but they contain messages which can point back to the original message registry. And so this lets me take all of the messages I've already defined and group them differently. So I can define all the message types logically in my message registry if I want to. And then when I'm saying, oh, this endpoint can take these four messages, I don't need to redefine them. I can just point them back. And then when there's a new version of that message, I'm still pointing at the new version. And so this is, I think, really what makes X registry powerful. It's that I can you know, I can extend my different types of metadata with these references and I can group it however I want to. And I don't have to use the built-in metadata types. I can add my own metadata. Maybe I care about managing my databases and what tables I have in my database and information about that so my developers can access that across different clusters or different systems. So I can use the same API to access all that, which means if I'm building tooling to talk to this, I don't have to have different, like, interactions. I can just keep using the same methods for all the metadata. And so, just to summarize, the key points are that it's extensible and consistent. So, if I want to go back to those questions about Cloud Events SQL, and I want to know how do we know which attributes exist for events in our system, I would check the message registry. If I want to know what values those attributes have, that would also be in the message registry. And then if I want to know which endpoints in my systems want which events, I can go and look in the endpoint registry and see which messages they care about. And if I want to know where they're coming from, I also look in the endpoint registry and see which producers have those messages. So that takes us to the end of the presentation for today and to the Q&A. I hope sort of the why behind why you might want to use X registry is a bit clear and sort of how Cloud Events has come to Cloud Events, SQL has come to X registry makes a bit more sense now. So thank you. So any questions, you can use the mic, or if there's not a lot of people here, so you can probably just shout it as well. Thank you, Cal. Uh, so if, if this X registry has all these messages, would it be a good practice to have a replication or a replicant a backup registry of the X registry just in case it fails? Or it, is there no failure point at all? So this? it depends on the implementation. Right now, they're mostly working on the specification for how you describe this stuff. Okay. So the initial implementation was you just have a file in GitHub somewhere that has all of this in a big JSON format. Um, and the newer one, which is also part of the X registry, it, which has all these HTTP methods I was talking about, they've got an implementation which has an SQL server backing it up, and you'd probably want to do all your normal stuff for the database backing it. Gotcha. Um, but the key thing for X registry isn't actually 
you know, how are you running this? It's the API and how do you interact with this and exactly what metadata goes in there. They want that to be standardized more than exactly how you run it to be standardized. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? All right, I guess we can end a little early then. Thanks, for everyone who made it out. <laughs>